And now to close for side opposition and the debate as a whole, we have Dr. Benny Pizer. Benny is a social anthropologist specializing in environmental and socio-economic impacts. He is also a visiting fellow at the University of Buckingham. Benny, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam President, ladies and gentlemen. I'm opposing today's motion because I regard as perhaps the most inhumane and amoral motion ever proposed at the Cambridge Union. <laughs> Let me explain. You may laugh. People outside these halls and outside Britain and outside Europe don't laugh. What the motion suggests at that is that societies and governments should abandon the traditional goal of economic growth while prioritizing policies to decarbonize. In short, economic growth and development should be sacrificed in the name of climate protection. Thankfully, not a single government in the world, not even the IPCC, is advocating this kind of economic self-harm, nor is any country or any government even close to adopting a motion that is extremely dangerous. And thankfully, no one outside of Europe is any longer listening to European Greens, radical Greens, that are advocating something that the rest of the world cannot accept. Nevertheless, the fact that stopping economic development is even being advocated by some of the world's most privileged students. Um, I, I don't want to use the name or the word spoiled, but that's what many outside these um, facilities may think about the kind of comments we've heard. Reveals how far removed, how far removed this green bubble is from the harsh reality of billions of people who are desperately trying to escape poverty. Let's not beat about the bush. If today's motion would ever be implemented by some radical green government or tin pot dictator, it would lead to the death of millions of poor people in the developing world, astronomical mass unemployment, and economic collapse. That's because poor nations without economic growth have no future and are unable to raise living standards for their impoverished populations. But we don't need to speculate what green subsidies and climate taxes have already done to people struggling with rising energy costs. As these taxes and subsidies have dri driven up energy prices all over Europe, a growing number of families are forced to decide whether they heat their homes or whether they can buy food. For millions of people all over Europe, the EU's green energy policy has proven to be an economic and social disaster. And most of you, you, you I, I guess you don't even care, that this whole agenda has led to the biggest wealth transfer in the history of modern Europe, from poor to rich. Just imagine who is reaping the hundreds of billions that are going into renewables. It's the landowners, it's the people who can afford solar panels, solar farms, biogas. It's those people who can afford all this green stuff paid by ordinary families, by poor families, who are forced to pay the rich for their virtual uh, signaling. 20 times as many people die each year from cold-related illness than from heat. And you want to cool the planet? The Office of National Statistics in England and Wales shows that based on past numbers, one million Brits are expected to die from cold in their homes by 2050. Do people in this room really want to cool the planet by how many degrees? Energy poverty is sweeping Europe. 
Germany, which is one of the richest country in the world. 15% of the population live in fuel poverty. This year alone, 300,000 families have had their electricity switched off. And they're literally sitting in the dark because they can no longer pay their electricity bills. Six million German families have been threatened with the same fate because if they don't pay up. And that's happening in one of the world's richest countries. So while Europe is pleased with its green policy, is stagnating and losing its competitive edge, much of Asia, in contrast, is booming, mainly due to its increasing reliance on cheap and abundant oil and gas and coal. And this is going to get much, much, much stronger. The International Energy Agency this week published its new report expecting... Pardon? Yes? Why then is uh, China such an enthusiastic partner in the Paris agreements? Why is it that Chinese people are complaining about the smog that's ruining their yes. cities as okay. a result of this breakneck uh, coal-fired right. expansion? Well, these are two questions. The one... It's a, it's a, these are two very good questions. Why is China so enthusiastic? Well, because China was pressured for many years to do something, and what they got was the Paris Agreement, which basically gives China a blank check. And with the air pollution, this is because they have a lot of old power plants, just like Britain had 50, 60 years ago. You may have heard in history that London's air was similarly polluted long time ago, and the power plants now have to be cleaned up Nothing to do with CO2, by the way. It's about real pollution, real air pollution, and it's about all power plants. But let me come back to remind you of the challenges in the developing world. Africa, with 1.2 billion people and 20% global land mass, makes just 3% of the world's electricity. Half of Africa's population, 600 million people, have no access to energy whatsoever. China, in contrast, with a similar amount of people, a little bit more, um, generates 12 times more energy as Africa. And why? Because China is basically burning everything they can find, right? So you think, well, China is such a green country. No, China isn't a real green country. They are building conventional power plants, one or two power plants per week, and they are not stopping at this point. Yes, please. But economically, what do you think is going to happen to those countries when the coal and the oil runs out? Good point. That was... That's a very good point, because that was a fear that drove part of the green agenda over the last 30, 40 years, the fear that we would run out of coal and oil and gas, and therefore alternative energies were, and nuclear energy were regarded as solution. Along came the shale revolution in the US. We are swimming in conventional fossil fuel energy, which is part of the problem for the, for the green movement, because there is now too much conventional fossil fuel energy. There is no risk that any country will run out of uh, affordable, cheap, and at least for the next 50 years. I don't know about... Right. Pardon? That's the first fact you got right. <laughs> well, I'm so pleased. I'm so pleased mm -hmm. to hear that you're approving. Um, it's good at least to have... One person on this side approving if you have one side it's already gone or, or has it chirped? <laughs> already gone. Yeah. Um, listen, the growing anger of many Africans about Europe's green obsession and hypocrisy. Because let's face it, you're all flying in, I don't know how often, on holiday in air, airplanes and are spending crazy and want good salaries. All this... Am I allowed to say crap here? All this crap <laughs> about money, duh, we don't care about money. Money doesn't, 
buy love and we, we don't need money. Is it, come on, pull another one. All the growing anger about Europeans' hypocrisy, Europeans preaching the rest of the world not to use the energy which made us wealthy, right? Which made Britain wealthy, Europe wealthy, America wealthy. Can I finish the sentence at least? Yeah. Um, was brilliantly summed up by Nigerian um, finance minister, Mrs. Kimi Addison. And listen carefully, guys, so that you know what African leaders think about the kind of unfortunate, well-meaning, but unfortunate stuff that was said today. And listen carefully. She said, we in Nigeria have coal, but we have a power problem. Yet we've been blocked because it's not green. There is some hypocrisy because we have the entire Western industrialization built on coal energy that is the competitive advantage that the West has been using. Now Africa wants to use coal and suddenly they are saying, no, you have to use solar and wind, which is much more expensive after polluting the environment for hundreds of years and now that we want to use coal, Europeans are saying no. That is the hypocrisy at the core of the problem. The goal of humanists and humanitarians cannot be to deny the world's poorest access to cheap and reliable energy. This is what to today's motion, I'm almost done, sorry, is essentially about at its very core, this motion is deeply wicked and should be rejected by everyone who takes the urgent needs of the world's poor into consideration rather than prioritizing an intolerant, if well-meaning, green agenda that is hurting millions of people. Thank you.